Hello YouTube friends, Dr. Teresa here. I'm coming up on the one year anniversary of acquiring my captive bred dwarf seahorses. And as a response to a special request from subscriber, I'm not sure if it's MCADW or McAdoo, um, but thank you for the request. It's a little bit early, but she said she would just love to have a really detailed update of how the dwarf seahorses are doing. So that is what this video is about. Well, in the course of the year, especially as we got towards the end of summer, beginning of fall, we're in the middle of winter now here in the Midwest, I had actually gotten up to over 120-ish seahorses. This is a video I took at the end of the summer at night, and I did it at night because the seahorses like to hang on to these colorful fake anemone plants, and it's a lot easier to see them. When they're dispersed through the day, it's hard to believe that there are so many seahorses in my 10 gallon aquarium, but at night it's a lot easier to see because 40 to 50 seahorses cluster on those fake colorful anemones. Now I've been able to rehome some of them, maybe 40-ish, and between some die-offs and the water quality and the rehoming, I have probably around 60 at the moment. I started off with 22 captive bred seahorses. One died within the first few weeks, and it's been about a year since I acquired them, but once the spring and summer hit, they were really reproducing like crazy. And I could tell a big difference in the water quality and being able to keep the tank clean once I was hitting that 100 mark of the seahorses. Once I was able to drop the population down, I did have some start to die once that water quality was hitting the roof of its safe parameters uh, and fewer babies were surviving. Um, but once I was able to get that population down to where I have it now, I, I noticed a huge difference. The cleanup was much easier, the water looks great, and I'm not having any more die-offs. Some other dwarf seahorse keepers have asked me what my secrets are or the strategies to my success, and I don't really feel like I do anything special, but I just try to keep things as simple as possible. So for one thing, I just use a plain, old-fashioned 10-gallon aquarium, and I keep it as sparse as possible while still allowing places for the seahorses to hitch. And I try to use different hitches that stay clean pretty easily. In other words, they don't capture a lot of detritus or waste. They're also easy to clean. So maybe they're not looking the best. And you might notice throughout my videos, you'll see different kinds of artificial plants or plastic kitchen posts in the tank and I'm swapping them out just because I'm experimenting them with them. I, I have a lot of red in there now. I'm not sure I'm liking that. I may swap back to add more green. But again, I like that they have lots of hitching posts and it's very simple, doesn't collect waste, and is easy to clean. Notice that the bottom of the tank is bare. I don't have any plants, I don't have any substrate. That just makes it easier to clean. I do vacuum out the bottom of the tank every night. And in that vacuuming, it takes out anywhere from one half to up to two gallons. So in other words, five to 20% each day. On the weekends, I scrub or wipe down the sides in front of the glass. I do let algae grow on the back of the glass, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. And I'm experimenting with letting a little algae grow on the bottom. Not sure how I like it yet. It's only been about two weeks. Maybe it'll look different and I'll like it better. But 
uh, uh, on those weekend cleanings, I also make sure I do that 20-ish percent water change. So there's fresh water being added to the tank every day, anywhere from that half gallon to two gallons. And I use prepared seawater that I mix myself using synthetic sea salt and reverse osmosis water. Because I do such regular water changes, I don't even test the water parameters anymore. I know some people like to test them and monitor them, but I really didn't feel like it helped me very much. I just look at how the seahorses are doing, if they're being successful as far as normal behavior, or if they're acting unusual, or if I'm starting to have some die-offs, more baby die-offs than normal. And when I do the water changes, again, I'm not a fanatic about it. Even if I change as much as 20%, I don't worry that the temperature isn't exactly the same as that is in the tank. Um, as long as the specific gravity and the temperature are pretty close to what I already have in there, nothing too drastic, I just go ahead and add all that new fresh water at once. And it doesn't seem to have harmed the seahorses at all. In fact, some people say that if you want your dwarf seahorse is to start breeding and you haven't had luck do a really big water change because they're used to big fluctuations in water especially with the tidal waves in nature and sometimes that's a stimulation of a change uh, corresponding with season and so they respond in that way by breeding. I mentioned previously that I let algae grow on the back wall and I have a couple reasons for that. One is copepods that are in the tank seem to be reproducing and growing in there and you can see the seahorses eating off the back wall. They're hunting for copepods and quite often they snap when they catch one so they know that the copepods are in there. It also helps keep the tank stable. I have a very easy copepod raising regime. I have a jar of old tank water and I keep it in a windowsill. And basically I have a batch of copepods in there and I have two little copepod houses and then I just swap out a house each week. So one house will go into the tank when I do the big water change on the weekend and then I put the one from the tank in the jar and then the next week I swap them out. And that seems to be sustaining a population of copepods in the tank just doing that. Of course, most home hobbyists would never be able to raise enough copepods to sustain dwarf seahorse populations because the seahorses just deplete the copepod populations so quickly. You can see that the seahorses are even finding copepods on the aquarium decorations that are also growing algae and they eat from there. But the main staple of seahorses in the home aquarium is live brine shrimp or artemia. Some people know them as sea monkeys and those have to be hatched out on a pretty regular basis. Depending on your size herd and the size of your aquarium, you might need to hatch out artemia every single day. I get away with about once every other day because I have a new big giant hatching system which has been worth it for me. And you can also see here that I have a hatching dish and to the right I have another type of hatcher which really has hatched brine shrimp in it already and it has all the enrichment in it. There are lots of ways to create enrichment for brine shrimp. I'm just showing some of the different products that I'm using. I actually use all of them and grind them up in a little coffee grinder. But you could use just spirulina alone. I have used um, just selco or selcon alone. But I'm experimenting with some huffa powder added in and notice how I have a powder here that is all of those ingredients combined. And when I get it all ground up, I mix it with some prepared salt water and I let it sit for a little bit and when it is ready 
I sift out the fine powder and I just store it in a bottle in my refrigerator and I just use it from there, pretty simple. Of course the brine shrimp has to be separated from its shells before it is enriched and I use this hatching dish just as a separator. I really don't use it as um, a hatching dish very often. Sometimes if I'm going to work late I'll put on a hatching dish to extend out my regular batches of hatching. They do work pretty well for vacation and sometimes I'll have three of them going at once and somebody can just come once a day and feed the seahorses while I'm away. So you can see my separation process here. Um, you put the brine shrimp on the outside of the rings and then you fill it up, put the lid on, and the brine shrimp is attracted to the light. And then after a little while, you'll see a bunch of brine shrimp gathering in the center there. And if you're just feeding it directly to the tank, I would rinse that little mesh net that's in the center first and then add it to the tank. But that's a little tedious for the way I do it. So I take the lid off and I use a turkey baster and just put the collected brine shrimp in a container, rinse it, and then put that in my enrichment vessel. If you have a small herd of seahorses, one or a couple of the hatching dishes might be enough for you. I actually just purchased another one, so I'm going to have four, used some gift card money from the holidays because my herd's pretty big and if I go on vacation and have someone feed the seahorses for me, I need to make sure there's gonna be enough food for them while I'm gone. Another strategy I use is that I vary the density of the brine shrimp amounts that I keep in the tank at one time. So here it looks kind of sparse. Other times it's super, super dense, almost like a cloud. And I find doing that also keeps the seahorses stimulated into breeding. I don't know, maybe it mimics nature. Maybe it does something um, that imitates the natural abundance and depletion of available food during the different times of year, but that's something that I just do naturally as I clean out one batch of my enrichment on a weekend and then just start completely from scratch for the next full week. And then one final strategy I use is that I clean everything very well. So after hatching the brine, all of the vessels, I might spray it with one or two sprays of very diluted bleach water or add some hydrogen peroxide or both depending on what I'm doing. I use a one drop ratio of soap water to a quart of water to dip rinse my brine shrimp nut just so that I don't have any bacteria growing. This practice prevents any buildup of harmful bacteria that could be transmitted to the seahorse tank. As you've realized by now, keeping dwarf seahorses is a lot of work and the more you have, the more work it is, but they really are a lot of fun. I have a couple of different generations going now, so I have babies who've had babies that are now having babies. I know once spring comes, I'm going to have to try to rehome some of the seahorses again. I have been able to rehome them. Here's a cute little baby, about three or four weeks old. Um, for a small adoption fee, I've been rehoming some of them, but I just don't know what I'm going to do with the spring. I have been rehoming them locally. I'm not shipping them. Shipping is a lot of work. I do work a full-time job, so that's not an option for me right now but I really enjoy them and they are so darn cute. And you can see a lot of the beautiful colors like in this one towards the leftish center, there's a beautiful yellow one. And we'll see different browns here also. Looks like there's a little baby hanging out in one spot there, a little hard to see in this view. There's a beautiful yellow one right there, just gorgeous. So they really are a lot of fun, and it looks like I just had a 
few more babies born today, so even though this is not their breeding season, they continue to breed, and I'm guessing it's because of all the strategies that I do use that seem to be working for me. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the update on the seahorses. I enjoyed putting it together. It was a lot of fun to talk about how this project has really progressed over the past year and the success rate that I've had with them. Thanks so much for watching. If you have other ideas that you would like me to talk about related to the seahorses or any of my other topics on my playlists, please reach out to me. I appreciate the feedback and the direction. Take care.